Hello everyone, this is Mike Quincy connecting the light. Uh, my guest today is Rahasia Poe. He wants to talk about his book called To Believe or Not to Believe, The Social and Neurological Consequences of Belief Systems. Uh, in particular, we both want to talk about part three, which is titled Rewriting Human History, which gets into the archaeological finds of the past century and interviews with a number of people on what the Vedic literature has to say about the topic of extraterrestrial intervention into our bloodline. So, uh, Rahasia tells us that he believes the consequences of our religious and national belief systems in light of the fact that their religious beliefs date back to the Iron Age uh, has certain consequences which we're going to talk about. So after that introduction, welcome to the program, Rahasia. Thank you for having me. Well, it's, it's, uh, it sounds like a very good subject with plenty of uh, mileage in it, as one might say. Now, I think it, it probably is best to start off with just giving a little outline on the first part of your book, bearing in mind that we're going to go to part three. So, how does it build up to part three? Well, actually, it's the social and neurological consequences that actually led to part three. But what mm -hmm. started this was when I was about seven years old, in a Bible school in West Virginia, you know, I, I noticed a lot of inconsistencies, even as a seven-year-old, um, like God attempting to drown us all just a few chapters after he was well pleased. And it was these kinds of incongruencies that got me started at a really young age. So I started asking questions and mostly questioning people's answers. And it's been a lifelong path for myself. And the social consequences... Well, let's face it, the Inquisition, the Crusades, the burning, and even the more recent times, the occupying of foreign countries. Because remember, we're talking about nationalistic ideologies and religious beliefs. So, go ahead. Yes, uh, I think that, that must cover that part of your book very adequately. And I must say, I tend to agree with you. And in fact, you've... Uh, touched, I know, upon the Anunnaki, the Sumerians, and uh, Nibiru, and it seems to me, having read a lot of uh, Sechari Setsin's books, that the Anunnaki are reptilians that came periodically to the earth uh, on, the, on Nibiru, and they falsely presented themselves as gods to the Sumerians, and I think this uh, accounts for the false god that one moment can be happy and the next minute, as you said, wants to sort of drown everyone. Now, is that the way you also see it? Well, it's pretty close to it. Uh, if, if we're to believe the uh, Sumerian clay tablets, basically what happened is the same thing that happened to El Cortez. When he landed upon the shores, he had no idea that they would be recognized as gods, but quickly seen the advantage of being recognized that way and from the early talks of Inky and Enlil a couple of the uh, brothers they yeah, seen yeah. this as an advantage they they also thought it was strange because in the Anunnaki language they don't even have a concept for a creator god which actually leads me to believe that maybe as we evolve as a people and as a society and as human beings we eventually evolve and realize this this is truly a mystery and to try to encapsulate it with some belief that some figure or personality created all this has really kept us from thinking and delving into the mystery deeper. Yes, I, I think you're you're right. And as you said there, if, if they haven't got a word for God, then that rather suggests that they wouldn't accept that concept, as many of our own people do. But if you think in terms of God as being the essence of everything that exists, uh, then I, I feel that's the better way of looking at it. But what is your own opinion about God or whatever energy people believe it is that has created all that is? I think this is where I get in trouble with all the different polarized groups. Because yes. 
somewhere in the middle there's a truth. I, I have atheist friends, I have religious friends, and I don't fit in either group because there does seem to be a creating pattern, a force underlying all of manifestation. And this has been going on ever since the very, very beginning. If, if you'll notice in the evolution of matter, matter has come about as a chaotic mess in the very beginning, the, the Big Bang, you might say. But soon after that, we, we see the coming together and the emerging of a pattern into atoms and cells and molecules. And each level is built upon the previous level. And now we're at the level of planetary human beings being the accumulation of all the previous levels. And if this continues, as it's continued for the last 15 billion years, then the next step would be for human beings to come together to make a planetary mind. So in that sense, I, I think there almost has to be a creative force, whether it's self-conscious or not, this is, herein lies the mystery. In your book, uh, you have said that we are on the verge of taking a step forward in our evolution of spiritual consciousness, and that fits in very well with the belief that we are, in fact, in the process of ascension, and there will be a very sort of great leap forward very soon. Is that again something that figures in your thinking? Yes, and my whole focus on beliefs is the fact that most beliefs are divisive and conflictive and oftentimes dangerous, especially in a society with advanced technology. Because you have to remember, it hasn't been that long ago, 100, 150 years, if you really wanted to wipe out a whole population of people, you had to get a huge army together with all kinds of armament and logistics. Mm -hmm. But now all you need is one person with a suitcase bomb. So yes, I, yes. I, think, I think the time has come to pay a little more attention to these Iron Age beliefs that we've been building our whole empires around and not questioning. Indeed, Indeed. yes. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. Uh, but I would like to just look back on something else you commented on because you have said yourself we are all connected to... Uh, a giant or a great energy field and I think you were questioning whether indeed the same as I was that this energy field is what we called God I think you refer to it as the zero point field yes I, I think uh, it's just a matter of definition we could call it God but God has so much baggage put on it I'm not too sure that works anymore we might call it uh, universal being universal consciousness uh, an underlying source of energy, a pattern. We're, we get into dangerous territory when we try to encapsulate it in uh, a definition, I think. Mm -hmm. But the strange uh -huh. thing is, is when we're, when we're talking, like you and I are talking here, the strange thing about this is we both know what we're talking about, really. Mm. But we, we can't put it into words always. Would that be correct? Yes. It's very difficult to put it into words because when we do, we divide it. And the truth of the matter is, is we're probably so much a part of that pattern, that field of energy, that we are the energy. And we have to remember, even in some of the, the texts that we're questioning right now, like the Bible or the Koran, even in the Bible says that we, we are one, we're part of this. Ye two are gods, even as I am. It's spoken yes, by some of these masters throughout history, but what happens is when a society without the spiritual evolution or level gets involved and starts rewriting everything, it brings it down to a level to where it's actually absurd. Yes. Um, I, I notice uh, in one part of your book you have spoken of our reality and questioned as to how solid, solid it is. And I think you equate that with the ability of some people to hypnotize another person and actually get them to believe that they cannot see something that is perfectly solid and in front of them. It's an interesting point, I think. Yeah, it actually shows the, the power that our mind does have over this pattern, this energy, this manifestation of 
uh, what we call reality. And we've been noticing this ever since the double slit experiment. We know now that our consciousness does interact even at the atomic level of matter. Right. So, what does that mean in terms of our physical bodies? I mean, are we individual units with our own power of belief, or are we influenced by everyone else? Well, I, I think that question, along with a lot of questions that we need to start asking, has a yes and a no. Because the more I look into different aspects of life and science and religion, I have noticed that there is no yes or no, but yet there's both. And it's, <laughs> it, it's a very tricky area because we haven't developed the, um, the language to really negotiate with these thoughts. Mm. Right. So, how do we know what we know, I think was a question that was asked in your book, talking about our consciousness, consciousness field. I think you quoted someone else, uh, am I correct, that was Lynn McTaggart. So how do we know what we know? <laughs> yeah, how do we know, and how do we know we know it? I, I guess yeah. it boils down to experience. For instance, and this is valuable to really understand when it comes to how we accept beliefs as our truth and we identify with them. It would be like if I, if I set up this uh, restaurant and people come to my restaurant and they're hungry, they're expecting food and they sit down, but all they get is the menu with pictures of food. <laughs> they're not really going to get any nourishment, but if I can convince them and really make them believe that they just ate a meal by simply looking and not having their own experience, they'll walk out and be satisfied for a while, but eventually kept catches up to you. Eventually we need to ingest through experience those inner truths that we're really seeking. Mm. Uh, again, a very interesting point there. But of course, I suppose it is only human to want to have beliefs. There seems to be this urge inside most people to seek out the truth, and this is really what we're looking for, isn't it? Yes, and in a sense, again, this is where we have to really define what we're talking about, because I need to believe, when I go to sleep at night, I need to believe that tomorrow I'll be able to get up and start off my day. I mean, we have certain beliefs that allow us to take the next step, but some of the beliefs that we're talking about are really belief in ideology systems systems that we bought into and have become dogmas that we live our lives by century after century irregardless of what we have found in science and experience mm. right okay uh, let's move on to something else that's very topical at this time because of the expectation that this cycle is about to end uh, the Mayan prophecies uh, with regards to 2012 what is your view about that? Well, I think based upon the fact that so many cultures have talked about the same thing for so many years, I mean, the Hopi, the Cherokee, the, the Aztec, the Mayans, they've all talked about this time in question. Even the builders of the pyramid, when they built the Great Pyramid of Giza, there's a, a little channel that points up to the sky with a star map to the right with Sirius, and it's only at this time in our history that the star map lines up to how the, the pyramid is built. So whoever built that pyramid, whether it was 4,000 or 20,000 years ago, they went to a great deal of effort to tell future generations, knowing that we're going to go through all kinds of turmoil and weather changes and catastrophic events. Knowing this, they went to a great deal of effort to point out that we need to pay attention to right now. And then when you look at the Mayan prophecy, you have to remember too that whoever it was that gave them their calendar told them that at the end of the calendar they would return. Right. Now, uh, I have read from channeled messages that in fact the information they used, which seemed to be quite unusual for people as we view them in that period of history was given to them by ETs and I believe you 
do agree that we are even now being visited by ETs. Yeah, I mean, I, I would feel foolish to not at least look at the information and come to that uh, conclusion. But again, if you if you just look at the prophecies of indigenous peoples, which have always been more in touch with uh, a lot of the Earth intelligence, they all say the same thing, that we're, we're getting ready to be visited. And uh, I think we should pay attention to this, because even recently, as recently as this month, the United Nations is starting to print up a protocol what to do on a global level and they're working with NASA, what to do on a global level if and when we're visited by extraterrestrials. So we have to ask ourselves, if the United Nations is doing something like this, it must mean something. Oh, yes, yes. yes. I, I think absolutely, and indeed I can add to that uh, some information that's come out just this week, which uh, claims that Obama... Uh, is ready to announce the presence of ETs and apparently there is a date set, a final date set for this announcement for the 1st of January next year and uh, it is said that if the announcement isn't made at that date then the ETs will present themselves in such a way that the governments will have no alternative but to admit to their presence because it will be so obvious and um, cannot be really disputed so I think yes something is building up uh, in fact this week I also read that they've actually appointed uh, a lady to be the representative of the UN but later uh, that was denied I don't know if you're aware of that no I wasn't but I think what you're talking about is another aspect of the same thing that is to work out the protocol for receiving ETs who want to be announced I suppose because you know what it, it seems to all be converging at the same time so this could be a very traumatic event for a lot of people that aren't in touch with some of the information that we're talking about I mean, and this information goes way back Alice Bailey she once said this will be a time of telepathic interplay which will eventually annihilate time as we know it Pierre de Chardin, translation or dematerialization into another sphere of the universe. And more recently, Terence McKenna said, our minds will unite like the fragments of a hologram. So a lot of people on the edge of this conscious pioneering evolution that we're on are picking up this for many, many, many years. Indeed. Indeed. Yes, and I, I, I liked your, also your quote from Ken Carey, whose work I very much admire, who said we will experience full consciousness of who we are. Yes, and I, I think that that consciousness is going to be the, the culmination of coming together with a completely different kind of global mind, a planetary mind, in, in which we can't even imagine right now. I mean, Imagine if you were the cell in a heart, and I was a cell in the same heart, how difficult it would be to imagine what it would be like to be fully conscious in the being that we inhabit. Mm. It's another realm of dimensions and sight and sound and hearing, things that we can't even have the conceptual language to even talk about. Mm, indeed. And uh, you also quoted the Incas, and I thought this also was a very good reference, that we are meeting ourselves again, which clearly infers that we have come from the higher dimensions. Right. And the Aztecs, you know, this every tribe, the Pueblos, the Dogon tribe, I'm sure you know about the Dogon tribe in Africa, they, they were visited about six or 700 years ago and they were given star information on Sirius A and B, the time it took for Sirius to go around Sirius A, and we're just recently, in the last 20, 25 years, coming to some of this knowledge. Mm. Right. Uh, when you move on to Christian beliefs, which I believe you can relate as far as the stories go, uh, 
that is in the Bible uh, to Egyptian times I believe you found a lot of similarities with stories such as the final judgment the virgin birth and so forth would, would you like to tell us a little bit about uh, what you actually found in the Egyptian sort of stories sure. Well, while doing the research for my book, I was uh, privileged to really be able to get in touch with quite a few uh, rabbis, priests, and biblical scholars. And one of the things that started coming to light is the higher up the chain you go as far as education, the less people really take the story literally. And I was asking them, well, where does this come from? I mean, if I give you a piece of information, the first thing you want to know is where did it come from? Well, if you go back to the Sumerian tablets, which were written about 3000 BC, you'll find that there's like the epic of creation. And the epic of creation is almost word for word the Genesis story. Uh, the epic of Gilgamesh was the uh, story of the flood. But they predate the biblical stories by centuries, if not millennia. So this brings to question another thing. If if the whole Judeo-Muslim Christian religions are based upon the absolute fact, and this is from biblical scholars, it's based upon the absolute fact that Moses went up to the mountain and spoke to God, and God gave him the first five books, which is the Torah. Well, if that's not true, then that sort of pulls the hinge pin out of all three religions as far as their validity. And I think in today's world of polarized religious beliefs, I can't see anything more important than taking some of the fire out of these groups. Yes. Uh, I take it you mean that in the sense that people will have to start thinking for themselves rather than being led into what they should believe. Yes, question everything. Because, again, if, if you just accept a belief without questioning it, without validating it and seeing it for yourself experientially again it's like looking at pictures of food thinking that you're eating but you're not mm -hmm. I mean I to me it, it doesn't even really matter if, if Moses actually had that event or not but that was his experience I'm looking for my own experience and if I accept his experience as my own it's I'm not going to get anything out of it it's not going to cause any transformation of consciousness if I do that right now, I'm sure with all your research, you must have uh, come across the articles which cover the uh, meeting that Emperor Constantine had, uh, I think it was about 300 AD, where he actually formulated what we know as the Bible. And I read that what he effectively did, and this is my words, he took what you might call the best of many other people's religious beliefs and put them into the, into one book which he called the Bible. Now, would, that, would you agree with that? Well, basically, that's... Conclusion? Yeah, that's where the Bible that we have today somewhat came from. And mm. a lot of that, you have to remember, Constantine's whole nation was divided and there was a lot of Christians at the time and his mother was a Christian. Mm. And he's seen this as a very good... Um, movement on his part to save his empire and it worked and it's been working ever since because something that the state has noticed for many many centuries is something that Voltaire brings out if if they can make us believe in absurdities they can make us commit atrocities mm -hmm. and what people have found out in state and nations is that they can get religious people that believe in something not connected to reality to get them to believe that is the same mental attitude and the same neurological uh, patterns that it takes to actually manipulate a person to do things that they wouldn't normally do. Mm. Yes, and I think a lot of that uh, in some religion comes from telling people that they will be rewarded if they do certain things for their God. Uh, horrible things which perhaps in the normal events they wouldn't even consider but it is because their God has said you do it and I'll reward you right yeah and, and, and again there, there is a neurological aspect to because you have to remember for a belief to be it has to be believable 
And sometimes if a belief is so totally absurd, now forget whether it's true or not true, put that out of your mind. If it's so absurd, it lacks any kind of experiential evidence for us to believe that, in the words of Dr. Andrew Newberg, he says what happens is for a belief to be believable, you need to start breaking neural connections from known evidence and from known experience. And if you do enough of that neurological breakdown, it can cause atrophy of the brain, which is actually, in his words, is called brain damage. Mm. Now, uh, speaking about the Bible, I believe you found uh, that there were some 70 verses that describe clouds as vehicles, which today we would probably say were UFOs. So, although some religious people might be fearing of UFOs and ETs, uh, the fact is that there are what you could call clear references to them in the Bible. Yes, many, many references, and, and we also have to keep in mind some of the words that were changed in the Bible. Uh, words like when they used the word horse, actually the Hebrew word meant flight or swiftness of flight. Wow. So, you know, little things like that changes a lot. And we also have to recognize, too, if I say to you, I've seen a flying saucer, well, you know that I'm not talking about a saucer from my cupboard, because this is the term... <laughs> that we use today. So back in those days, the only things that flew were clouds and birds. So it very well could have been that this is what they called them, clouds. Yes, I remember, I think, something from some Roman writings where they spoke about flying shields. So that they had to use their own descriptions that were understood at the time. Yeah, I think the only ancient text that really comes to grips with this and, and tried to explain it in a more technological way was the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. They speak of Vimanas and explain what a Vimana is. It's a round cylindrical disc and some of them they even explain how they had a propulsion of air that came out the back that pushed them through the air. So they, they gave a better um, definition of it. Right. Now, you do have some interest in the Roswell beings. What did you make of that whole episode? Well, I think that was the beginning of our really overt contact, especially on a governmental level. And if you have to think back about this, this was soon after we started letting off atomic bombs. And I think this is something that interests extraterrestrials because we are not quite sure what this does on an interdimensional level when we start busting apart atoms, but we do know that it <clears throat> it can really ruin our environment for many, many years. And I think at this level, they're, they're real interested in what we're doing. Uh, I think you're absolutely right there, because um, I think it was only in the last few weeks that there have been a number of uh, top military personnel that have come out quite openly with stories about ETs actually uh, neutralizing some of these bombs uh, where they are were actually held on on the sites. Right. Yeah, they've actually disabled some of our missile installations, and it was done as a show more than anything. Yeah, I, I think it certainly indicated that they disapproved of them, uh, and in fact, I've. I'm sure some many years ago I, I read a message from ETs saying that our problem was that we didn't understand that the effects of it went out into space and it affected other life forms outside of our own planet. Yes, we, we, we have no idea what we're doing. I remember reading that the scientists at the time of the Manhattan Project, quite a few of the scientists weren't even positive that if they blew off an atomic bomb, that that wouldn't just keep on blowing and destroy the planet. You know, yes. we, we do some very, very crazy, reckless things, and I think we're still doing it. Absolutely, yes. Now, it's an interesting fact uh, for everyone, and you mention it in your book, because again, it's something that's come, come up uh, very recently, is that the Vatican now acknowledge the existence of ETs. 
Yes, this came about with the uh, meeting of Monsignor Corrado Balducci. And you have to remember, this is not just uh, some priest. He was a Roman Catholic theologian of the Vatican Curia. He was an exorcist for the Archdiocese of Rome. And I think more important than anything, he was a Vatican insider and close, close friends to the last pope. And when he got together with Zachariah Sitchin, they, they had quite a few meetings, but on their last meeting, they agreed to three different things. Extraterrestrials can and do exist on other planets. They could very well be more advanced than us. And here's the most important one. And, and you have to remember, this is coming from a person in the inside of the Vatican. And the most important of all, man could be fashioned from pre-existing sentient beings that evolved naturally. Now, what this dates back to is the early Sumerian tablets where they're talking about the sons of gods coming here and uh, using the people that were here, which at that time was the Homo, safe, Homo erectus. And shortly after and suddenly in the archaeological record, we turn into Homo sapiens. And we never have been able to explain that missing link. But when you really look at the records, there is a lot of evidence for this happening. And the Sumerian tablets gets very specific, even with drawings of test tubes, even with drawings and um, detailed explanations on how they did this. Yes, so indeed it is correct to say that ETs exist and they are our brothers. Yes, and if we know this, we know the Vatican knows this. They have 50 or 52 miles of libraries. And I think the, the organized structures that's been organized and manifested out of our past, they're starting to collapse. I mean, I think we can all agree to that. Something's not quite right. Nations, religions, they're starting to show signs of collapse. And I think the Vatican knows that their days are coming, and I think they're trying to position themselves, even by um, building observatories, they're trying to position themselves for when that day comes, that they can transition into a new leadership role when the extraterrestrials do show up. So how do you think the presence of ETs or proof of ETs should affect our beliefs? Well, I think it's going to completely change everything. Um, I, everything. It, it's going to collapse a lot of uh, what's left that doesn't collapse over the next few years because things are collapsing. We're in the, the midst of a complete reconstruction. But I think if ET shows up, it's going to call fear in the hearts of diehard believers. As a matter of fact, we have a a channel here in the United States uh, and sometimes I, I'm, I get embarrassed to even bring this up being an American but we, we need to we have a channel here in the United States called the 700 Club and Pat Robertson was talking about how we should treat extraterrestrials if they do show up he says they don't exist but if they do show up we should make every effort possible to kill each and every one of them because they are from the devil and it's this type of thinking that we need to get past, and then, I mean, we need to get past it quick. Yes. Uh, on a similar vein, I read quite recently that an evangelist also said that anyone speaking about aliens should be stoned. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Yes, I, it is. It is I, sad, isn't it, that people uh, don't really investigate the circumstances correctly because you have to think that they would realize that these are peaceful friendly ETs I know there are other types as well but the ones that are mainly visiting us are really our friends right. and, and I think that they have learned what we have learned from intervening into an evolutionary society prematurely like we've intervened into a lot of the the indigenous people that lives in Africa and in Australia and by doing this and sending in our missionaries it's completely backfired they live in brothels they're drug addicted you know and now it's it's a complete mess and we interfered with a whole society that had lived in the jungles for centuries if not millennia so I think they know the same thing about us we need to make certain decisions and come to a certain level of 
involvement before they can really overtly intervene into our evolutionary pattern. Mm. Yes, indeed. Now, you clearly feel that the power of thought is a lot more powerful than we believe because you, you have mentioned that it affects our DNA and in consequence uh, it controls our health and presumably what you're saying is if our thoughts are powerful enough we can also heal illnesses so what are your thoughts about that area? Well again I, I think just take into consideration what we were originally talking about about humanity coming together I think as individuals, the power that we have over matter is uh, imperceptible. But something that has come up from much, much research, even David Bohm, he did a lot of, he was a quantum physicist around Earth, early 1900s. He recognized something, even on an atomic level, if you compress atoms together to the point of density that we call plasma, they stop acting as individuals. And whatever you do to one atom, all atoms equally react. And I think when we get to that point of concentration with people that are waking up to what we're talking about right now, we're going to ignite into another level of consciousness. And at that point, we're going to come up with remedies for a lot of these problems, which are nothing more than our feelings of alienation and us versus them. You know, that this me, you idea that we have will change from the inside out. Yes, I, I, I certainly believe you're correct there. So, do you think that as people come to realize that they have this innate power, that if they have a strong belief in it, they could actually start healing themselves even now? Yes, I, I think if we're going to have a belief, this this is a good belief to have because it's actually backed up from some of the science and research of the day. But the first thing we need to realize is, well, like Fred Allen Wolf, he, he wrote a book called Taking the Quantum Leap. He's a quantum physicist. He said the first thing we need to do is realize that some of our old beliefs are dysfunctional and no longer work, and they need to be dismantled. And we can only do that with just keep on hitting it with rationality and logic because uh, these beliefs run deep yes indeed <laughs> now the, the power of thought I think is something that comes in Dr. Masaru Emoto's works uh, I've read some of his articles about the consciousness of water uh, he also talks of consciousness expanding into other dimensions what do you know about that? But I think we're feeling the effects of that ourselves. I think other conscious beings, other conscious patterns and levels are emanating into our lower dimensions as we speak. I think this is a lot of when somebody gets an idea or some kind of epiphany or a transformation that they can't quite explain or this inner need that we're starting to feel to connect and have more empathy and compassion for other people. And even a lot of wars have been stopped just by the distaste of the aggressor. Not nearly enough, but this is showing that something is emerging. There's some type of sacred reality, as uh, King Kerry would say, that's emerging into our realm. And I, I think little by little, people are picking up on it. But the trouble is, it's like entrainment. If you have a vibration that's far too low, and you have a really high vibration, it'll pass right through it. So you have to bring the low vibration up to a level to where it can entrain and catch on to that higher vibration. And this is the importance of spiritual practice, working on our consciousness, our meditations, and being here in this present moment and paying attention. Even as we speak right now, it's easy for me to sit here and get really caught up into what should I say and thinking of how to answer this instead of just being in the moment and applying that moment intelligence mm -hmm. to this moment of your questions. You understand what I mean? Yes, indeed. Yes, yes. Uh, you might relate that perhaps to intuition, which is something that 
perhaps comes into your mind when you uh, are facing a situation which uh, often people ignore. <laughs> right. Yeah, and oftentimes, especially on an interview like this, the, the last thing you want is dead air, air time. So I think uh, there's a propensity to get too well rehearsed and too well prepared and it sort of takes the life out of what you want to say. Yes. Now, when you mention about higher beings consciousness, sort of uh, coming into our own, would you think that that is the reason why, or behind time speeding up? Yes, I, and again, we can use science as a, a little bit of a guideline here, because it does appear, you know, like with the Schumann resonance, resonance the earth is speeding up, particles are speeding up, and we're starting to learn so much about time and space. And uh, again, Fred Allen Wolf says, out there really isn't out there. And, and this is a, a new consciousness that's starting to come into our realm to where we're starting to see the world a little differently. Mm. Does that uh, relate somewhere to what I think you refer to as creation releasing energy. I mean, are, are we being bombarded by higher energy that will take us through a process of ascension anyway? Well, I, I think in the procession we're starting to tilt back towards the center of our galaxy and we are picking up new radiations that scientists have never picked up before. And I, I think sometimes when I'm trying to figure out something like this, I, I revert back to nature. And it's when you plant a seed in the springtime, there's a certain type of energy, a certain amount of energy coming from the sun, but as the seasons progress, the energy changes. And it's the right energy for the right time for that seed to blossom and show fruits. And I think we're at this point now in the procession of the equinox where we're starting to wake up. We're coming out of... Kali. We're coming out of the dark age. And as we do this, we're going to notice more and more new energies coming into our realm. And it's going to cause different things that's going to be making us question our reality and questioning our consciousness. And in that transition, a lot of us might notice that we're getting more confused. Our memory is getting a little more shaky. But if we can just hold on and follow this through and let it happen, because it has to happen. We can't make it happen. It either has to happen or not happen. And I think if we ride this, it's going to be the most interesting ride that we can imagine, and which is probably why people like you and I are here, to see this thing through. Mm, absolutely, yes. Looking, <laughs> looking forward to it. Uh, how do you think people that have a strong religious belief, say in the apocalypse, can accommodate this new type of thought? Well, actually, one thing that would help is redefining the apocalypse and also bringing to light the idea that the apocalypse is a prophecy. It's not a determined happening. A prophecy is any type of vision that you have based upon where you are and if you keep going in that direction what will happen which is actually just nothing more than common sense but a prophecy does not have to happen and that's something that the Bible makes very clear but very few preachers bring out because you know everybody wants you to re believe in the apocalypse because that brings about fear if you have fear then they have the way out of fear where you can be saved and it's like this giant organism that just sucks you in and all you have to do is really read the Bible and it clears a lot of this up. Somebody asked me, they said, what started you believing in Christianity? I said, well, I started to read the Bible. And they said, well, why aren't you a Christian now? I said, well, I finished. And once <laughs> you finish reading the Bible, all things come clear, especially when you start in with Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and Exodus. You know, we're, we're talking about some pretty horrendous gods, if you ask me. Mm. What do you think of the Bible as far as uh, supporting the idea of reincarnation? Well, um, 
Jesus says that uh, you will be sent out into the world no more to be a pillar unto man. But again, a lot of these things were taken out were taken out of the Bible with uh, King James, especially. But even earlier, anything that smacked of reincarnation was methodically taken out of the Bible. But there's still a few things in there, uh, even. When Jesus is talking about he was Elijah before he was him, and um, I, I don't think it really supports reincarnation too much at this point, because they don't want you to have the idea that you can come back and have another try at this. They, they want it all right here, right now, and this is what keeps the system going, especially with Christianity. Mm. Uh, I think the devil gets the blame for quite a lot of things, but from a personal point of view, do you believe there is such an entity uh, that could be described as a devil? Well, it's funny, what comes to mind is a saying by Nietzsche, he says, careful when you're throwing out the devil, least you throw out the best part of yourself. <laughs> and I, I think we all have to recognize and embrace the fact that we do have a human nature that is has evolved out of survival upon um, separating us from them. But one of the things that's happening is that's starting to dissolve. Now, whether there's an entity behind that, there may be, but we have to, again, go back to the original writings of the Anunnaki, the Sumerian tablets, mm -hmm. and we start seeing that Enki and Enlil, the two brothers, well... Inky and Enlil, one brother was good, one bro brother was bad. One yes. brother saved Noah, one brother wanted to drown everybody. And these were the two first people that became Yahweh and Jehovah, and we started mistranslating them as gods and devils. So we, we really have to really clarify the fact that the Bible is a misinterpretation of the original writings before we could even get close to talking about that. Yes. So it's sad in a way that there is this emphasis on the fact, as some religions claim, that the Bible is the word of God and they hold very fast to it. Right. And um, that, that just simply is not the way. No. And I, I think uh, if people tend to believe that, then perhaps there is fear within their minds if they uh, think of questioning what is in the Bible or what they are told that it means. Yeah, and any time you take something literally that was written back in the Iron Age, uh, you know, especially in the 21st century, you can get into a lot of trouble. Yeah. Now, logically thinking, I believe that when the ETs come, uh, they will come from an ascended uh, dimension one would think that they will bring with them and let us know a lot of knowledge about the truth of our being and God and things like that which would help us to take a great leap forward in say on the spiritual side right that's exactly what I'm actually counting on because to be honest with you the way we're going, if if we have to handle our problems, it's Einstein once said that you'll never come up with the solutions from the same level that created the problems. And if we don't have some kind of either an inner transformation or help from some kind of a divine source or extraterrestrials, I don't think we're going to be able to figure our way out of this. So I'm sort of counting on either a conscious transformation happening because of that's just how it always has happened or we're going to get help from an advanced society yes indeed I, I believe that is so uh, we're, we're very quickly coming to the end of the program where I take a minute to announce next week's guest uh, what sort of message would you have for people now well, I, I think the message right now is to really pay attention to what's going on, question everything, especially the answers that you've been indoctrinated into, especially nationalistic ideals and religious beliefs. These are the two things that's bringing our whole planet to its knees right now and, and could actually stop and obliterate human society as we know it. 
So I, I think it's a matter of looking to something new, looking to something more, and remembering that we are creating this as we go. So if we've created this mess, maybe it's in us to recreate a better world. Right. Would you like to give our listeners your website address and confirm where your book can be obtained from? Sure. You can buy my book at any bookstore. If it's not there, they can order it for you. And you can also go to my website, which is www.rahasiapo, which is R-A-H-A-S-Y-A-P-O-E.com. And I have a lot of information there about the people that I've 